My name is Nick Middleton. I'm middle-aged, I live in Middle England and earn a middling salary writing travel books and teaching geography at Oxford University. My life is extremely comfortable, or rather it was. It all changed when I started writing about the world's most extreme environments. The more I suffered in these godforsaken places, the more I saw that it's the hostile landscapes that have shaped man's existence on Earth. One of the most hostile is the vast area that has kept east and west apart. Crossable only via the network of trading routes known as the Silk Road, this wilderness of mountains, plateaus and deserts is one of the least populated on Earth. But life is sustained there. Just what sort of life my publisher felt was up to me to find out. journey begins in the mountains of heaven and will end at the gates of hell. Now I'm a geographer and I've always been intrigued by the delicate balance of existence in arid lands. Here water is the key to life. When it's well managed even marginal environments flourish but when it's mismanaged the consequences can be catastrophic. My ultimate destination is the Aral Sea in western Kazakhstan, an environmental disaster zone I'd written about but never seen. Until the 1960s, the Aral was the world's fourth largest freshwater lake, but since then the rivers feeding it had been diverted for irrigation, and in just 40 years the sea has become a polluted shadow of its former self. What I wanted to know was how the locals have survived since most of their former livelihood had evaporated. My research threw up a piece of video footage which hinted at just how desperate things had become. Some former fishermen had turned to looting an abandoned bioweapons research site on an island in the middle of the sea. I was going to the Aral to find these men but since the island, Vosrozdeny, had been a test zone for anthrax, smallpox and Ebola, I had come prepared. A bioprotection suit would, with luck, keep me alive. But my first test session wearing it, here on a salt flat far from the Aral Sea, was no fun at all. I've set up the uh, portable weather station here, with a temperature sensor underneath an umbrella. So it's just measuring the uh, temperature of the air, not direct solar radiation. And uh, this is telling me that it's uh, 39.3 degrees C, which is uh, 103 degrees F. So either way you take it, yeah, it's pretty hot. My journey to the Aral began on the other side of Kazakhstan, in the eastern corner, at the leafy former capital, Almaty. It looked at first like a typical Soviet-era 20th century city, but after a few hours you quickly saw signs that it's been around for a while. Indeed, my English-speaking guide, Bayan, immediately reinforced this impression of antiquity. She insisted that anyone undertaking any sort of journey, let alone one to the dead zone of the Aral Sea, had to consult with a shaman first. <laughs> We were in what is officially a modern Muslim nation, but according to Bayan, healers and witch doctors like Zebek still abound. Can you tell her I'm heading towards the Aral Sea and ask if she can offer me any help or advice? Zbek said that she prayed for you and she will be praying all your way 
to the RLC. She can help you with her n remedy, like a knife and uh, other uh, Kazakh traditional healing. Healing with a knife? Yes. Why not? <laughs> okay, as long as she's careful. <laughs> How big's the knife? Before the knife came smoke purification. <laughs> there were plenty of takers at Zebek's session. The collapse of the Soviet machine, with its employment, housing and pensions, had led to a huge surge in demand for shamanic skills. Fear and uncertainty, it seems, breed belief. As the smoke cleared, Zebek's knife came out. It didn't exactly look ancient. It didn't even look that shamanic. But it did look quite like a kitchen devil. <laughs> The healing ended with my arteries thankfully intact, but we weren't allowed to leave until we'd listened to a serenade from a man dressed in the Arsenal 2002 away strip. Surfing on a wave of Zebek's protection, I set off on my 2,000 kilometer journey due west across this vast Central Asian Republic to the Aral Sea. Along the way, if our rickety looking jeep hung on, I was hoping to see how the people survive here. For as you go west, so it gets drier, and water plays an ever more important role. But first, this is the steppe, the term for the rolling grasslands of Central Asia, which seem to go on forever and ever. I'd left Bayan to her shamanic devices in Almaty, but had hired Altai Zatkanbiev to translate for me as we headed west. This road is typical Kazakh highway. It's not so good in, <laughs> as European highways. After five hours of non-stop potholes, we stopped for a break at a settlement of what Altai called typical Kazakh nomads, where he was proud to show me 20-odd mares lined up for milking. What are they doing here, milking the horses? Yes, yes, typical ah. Kazakh uh, tradition. Usually in this process, uh, women attendants, because uh, horse milking has traditionally women. This milk using by local Kazakh people, it's necessary special preparation. We use uh, special bacteria. Um, Are they fermented? Uh, so, yeah, fermented, oh. uh, exactly. And so it's slightly alcoholic when you drink it? Yes. Though it was balmy here in July, in winter temperatures on the steppe plummet to 40 degrees below. Cows can't handle life that cold, but these seemingly fragile horses are fine, and without their meat, these people would find it hard to survive. Doubtless the horse milk beer helps keep the chill out too. My first contact with the Kazakhs of the steppe couldn't have been more tranquil and I was beginning to think that the stereotypical image of the fierce steppe warrior was obviously outdated, which only goes to show how wrong you can be. It was Saturday afternoon, and Altai, trying to undo the harm done to the Kazakhs' hard-known reputation by the pastoral scene of the morning, took me to the game. This is Kokpa. It starts with the beheading of a live goat and gets progressively more violent as the fun continues. It's thought to have been invented by Genghis Khan's followers as the ultimate test of man and horse. In very brief terms, how do you win this game? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Nick, would you like to train again on the horse 
and uh, attending for this game, Kokpan. <laughs> Would you like? Me? Yeah. Have a yeah. go? Yeah. Yeah. You're mad, no way. Not in a hundred million zillion years. Yeah. Looks really dangerous. Really dangerous, yo. Needless to say, I soon found myself in the saddle of what thankfully looked like a very docile horse and hung out on the edges of the melee. Koter, koter, alan koter! Hopke, get, 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 My horse seemed only to want to go backwards, much to the amusement of the spectators. When it came to the final game of the afternoon, I was still in the saddle. I'm not sure if I was being humoured or if the horseman just took pity on me, but suddenly, miraculously, I found myself in the middle of the action. Though as soon as I was gifted the goat, they got tough, and I headed for the touchline. Total madness. I mean, they really go for it. And when I, I actually look, I've still, still got a bit of the, the goat there in my hand. Um, and I had a good hold of it, but then two other guys came from nowhere and... And it, it's a good job a horse is a solid animal, because otherwise you'd come off in a second. It really would. It's, uh, it's truly symbolic of the, the wild, wide-open, horse-roaming steppe, because that's what it's all about. The Kazakhs of the lush steppe were certainly hard. But as we moved west into the desert lands, life was much more difficult. With very little rainfall, almost all the available water comes from rivers rising in the mountains. The problem is that most of the rivers are diverted into irrigation schemes long before they reach their final natural destination. Somewhere, still more than a thousand kilometers to the west, the Aral Sea was dying of thirst. My journey across the vast Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan continued, pushing towards the west and my final destination of the Aral Sea. Scorched by the searing continental heat of the summer, where temperatures can reach 50 degrees centigrade, the landscape was becoming more arid. Unlike the verdant steppe, this area cannot support large herds of livestock. Life is more marginal, and while the people do keep sheep, goats and horses, hunting is also a major part of life. Our route wound through the Charin Canyon, a spectacular chasm eroded by river waters over countless millennia. It's a bleak and pitiless place, and perhaps not surprisingly, it's home to a particularly pitiless Kazakh predator, the Golden Eagle. Altai had friends who were some of the last Kazakh practitioners of the suitably macho art of hunting with eagles. He's quite excited by that. <laughs> the speed with which... But completely silent. My noise is totally inappropriate. These birds have been trained here for at least a thousand years, helping not only to bring food to the table, but also keeping predatory wolves and foxes away from precious livestock. So, the hand moving is, is like that. Mm -hmm. And then as it swoops in, mm -hmm. like that, yeah? Yeah.